your Bibles. Come on, let's see your Bibles. Let's see your Bibles. Let's turn our Bibles in the book of Luke. Say look. look. Say stop. Stop. Say look. Look. Turn the person next to you. Say listen. Listen. Turn our Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 19. And we are concluding our series, Well, Who Do You Say That I Am? Uh, today. And I will be starting a new series soon, and I will give you information about that. Also, we are unveiling our theme for the camp uh, next Sunday. So a lot of stuff, well, good stuff going on next Sunday. But before that, let's all bow our heads and let's pray together as we get ready and God prepare our hearts uh, to receive His Word and study His Word this morning. Father God, Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to be here this morning. We understand, Lord God, that it's not everyone that's given the opportunity, Lord God, to, to commune with you and to be with you, Lord God. And, and Lord, we know, Lord, that two or more are gathered in your name. You are in the midst of them. And we acknowledge your presence, Lord God, this morning. We acknowledge the Holy Spirit that is moving within us, Lord God, this morning. And our prayer, Lord, as we conclude this series, that we have learned so much about this question. Who do we say that you are, God? Who do we say that Jesus is? Amen. Lord, may this question not just challenge us by the end of this series, Lord, but may we always strive to go deeper in our knowledge of you, in our relationship of you. And so, Father God, we commit this time to you now as we lift up everything to you. And um, we pray and we ask this, God, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Everybody says, Amen. 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 How many of you love listening to music? All right? I love listening to music. I'm, I'm an oldest kind of person. So I like I like the oldest, the 80s love songs. And, you know, and, and most of the time when you listen to a song that is so familiar to you, you would think that you know it. Can I hear you enough? You would think that you know it. For example, I have this song that I never really understood the lyrics before, but it was a song by, by Boys to Men. Uh, boy, don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. Um, it's called On Bended Knees. Uh, how many of you know the song? You say pretty much know the song, right? I started with Darling I. I'm not going to sing it. Can I can't explain. Where did we lose our way? Girls driving me insane. How many of you know the lyrics? And I know I just need one more chance to prove my love to you. And if you come back to me, I'll guarantee that I'll never let you go. You know when I heard this song the first time, I really thought they were sing singing about abandoned knees. <laughs> I heard this when I was young and then every time I sing it, I would sing it saying abandoned knees. But listen to the lyrics. Listen to the lyrics. Can we play it? Do we, do we have it? I'm down on my knees. <laughs> right? Doesn't it sound like abandoned knees to you? No? no? It sounded like abandoned knees to me. And every time I would sing this song, I would really actually say, I'm down abandoned knees. <laughs> I know it doesn't make sense, but you sing songs and sometimes you think the, the lyrics and you sometimes you think the word, and when you sing it, and you're like, I know it doesn't make sense, but it rhymes. <laughs> and it sounds like that is the exact lyrics. Are you with me? You know, the, the point of this is, you know, many times we think we know something until we really look at it and understand, oh, that's what it says. 
Many of the songs that I listened to when I was young, I didn't even know who sang them. I just loved seeing them. I just loved listening to them. And when I finally realized who sang them, I was like, oh, I never thought that it was that guy that sang it. And I don't know about me, every time I listen to a song now, it gets into my habit to look at actually the lyrics. Because sometimes you look like a fool singing the lyrics. You don't really know. Because our mind registers what we hear, but sometimes, without even realizing, we don't know really the lyrics. Can I hear an amen? As we conclude our series, the point is, the question that we are challenged here in the church as we go through this series is the question of Jesus Christ asking us, who do you say that I am? And a regular person will probably say, I know who, who, who Jesus is. I heard of Jesus. I attended church. You know, I attended this Catholic school when I was growing up. Or I attended a Bible school. You know, I know who He is. But the question is, unless, like last week, unless you really understand and you have a personal encounter with Him, that is when everything started to, uh, to make sense. Unless you look at the lyrics and you start to see, oh man, this is really what it says. And that's what happened in my life. I don't know about you, I'm not saying everything is the same. But that's what happened in my life. From, from a young age, growing up, I thought I knew Christ. I thought I knew God. I attended church, I go to, to a private school that has a religion class and everything else. And if you would ask me about 10, 11 years ago, if I knew God, my answer would be yes. But in reality, I never really experienced Him. I never really had a personal relationship with Him. And so last week we have seen that, the, that even demons, say demons, yes. knew who Jesus was and they trembled at His name. If this question is truly the greatest question we will ever face and ever have to answer, in our lives then we need help. Say help. help. We need help in answering this question. We cannot wake up just one morning and say, I got it all figured out. Even Paul says in the book of Philippians, I'm not saying I perfected everything. But here's one thing I know. I'm pressing towards I go, looking forward and leaving the past behind. He's saying I don't get it all right. But at least I'm grasping it. At least I'm moving forward with it. The challenge for us, all of us here believers, don't settle in with just what you believe in or what you just heard this Sunday. This is when it gets real. After this Sunday, how many of us would really open up a Bible the following day? How many of us would really raise our hand the following day? How many of us would really fall on our knees the following day? And that is not, you know, just a guilt trip to everyone. It's just the reality of how routine things can be. Or oh, I'm settled with what I heard from the church that Sunday. You know, I, I have my, my checklist. That's a check mark already. I heard something about Jesus that would last me through the week. But that's not how a relationship works. A relationship works is you nurture them. You nurture the relationship. You, you, you want to spend as much time with each other. You want to get to know each other. And, and, and here's one thing that's so interesting to me. I heard this before. It says, even though when you get married, don't stop knowing your wife. Don't stop getting to know your husband. Continue to get to know them. Continue to, to learn about them. Because relationship is a life experience. And so with our relationship with God, River Faith Church. Are you with me? Yes. How many of you, there are times that you feel like God, I feel like, I, I feel like we have cooling off. I feel like we're in a cool off situation right now. Like I, I just feel like I've been far away from you. Why? Because relationship can be routine. And if this question don't challenge us to say, God, I want to learn more about you. And if this question don't challenge us to say, God, you know what? I'm not going to let go. I'm not just going to settle with what I hear every Sunday and what just what I know about you. Then it will challenge us all to say, God, I really want to get to know you. More than what I know already about you. 
Imagine a year from now or two years from now, if your relationship with Jesus Christ would be much deeper and much stronger and much intimate than it ever had in your life. Let's turn our Bibles in Luke chapter 19. And in this story we're going to see today, we're going to see that the testimony about Jesus Christ is what resounded and what verifies who He is. And last week we talked about the demons. The demons even say that we know you, you are the Son of God. The only difference with the demons is us, they don't have that relationship that we can have with God. And this morning, the story that we're going to look at is that Jesus Christ is preparing to, to enter His town and, and it is called the Triumphal Entry or, or the Palm Sunday. That's what we celebrate in Palm Sunday when Jesus Christ ride on the donkey and paraded Himself and, 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 and offered Himself as the Messiah. And the people actually praise Him. But a week later, they crucified him. But you have to understand the significance of that. Because in the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, it was prophesied that the Messiah will enter and he will ride a donkey. And the people will sing praises to him, recognizing that he is the Messiah. But the problem there was, after they recognized him, they all backed out. And the following week, he was crucified. But what is the significance of that and what we're going to talk about today? There's a part there when the Pharisees and the religious leaders will saw what was happening. And you have to understand the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they're the Bible scholars. They know the prophecy. They know exactly what they are watching. They know that the, pro the prophet Zechariah has prophecy that the Messiah will ride on a donkey and will enter and the people will praise Him. And so when they see that, they start freaking out. This can't happen. This Jesus guy is not the Messiah. And so they told Jesus, tell your followers. Say, tell your followers. They told Jesus, tell your followers to stop what they're doing. And Jesus Christ says, and this is, the best part of it all is Jesus Christ said in Luke chapter 19 verse 40. But he answered and said to them, I tell you the truth. That if these should keep silent, my disciples, the stones themselves would immediately cry out. Jesus Christ said, even if I tell my disciples to stop praising me, guess what? The stones will not help themselves but to praise me because they recognize who am I or who I am. You have to understand that, that even creation recognized who Jesus Christ was. In the boat when everybody is panicking, Jesus woke up and says, why are you guys panicking? And they say, oh, we're all going to die. We're all going to die, teacher. And what, what did Jesus Christ do? He rebuked the storm. And just at His command, what happened to the storm? Went away. When He went to the fig tree when there's no fruit, what did He do? He touched the tree. And the Bible says that the tree, the, the, the tree what happened to the tree? It withered. And it says it, it shall not produce tree anymore. When He needed a denarius, to pay the tax collector's booth. What did he tell Peter? Go to the pond. There is a fish. And what you will find in the fish's mouth. Is a denarius. You have to understand that. Because Jesus Christ is God. That all creation. Submits to him. And all creation. Not just us. You know there's a part that, that just touched me. How many of you watched the movie Lion King? Right? And when they're doing that in the very beginning of the movie, you see what? All creation in the what? In the animal kingdom. They all gather. Why? Because the king's son is about to be presented. And once the king grabbed his son, Simba. Right? Um, bow, man. 
to the ice and I say that. <laughs> and right Simba, what did all creation do? They bow down. They're saying that, that, that the lion, what was the name of the dad? King Mufasa. Mufasa, I'm going to name my next child Mufasa. They come in Mufasa. They understood that the king of the jungle is the lion. And King Mufasa was the king of the kingdom, of the animal kingdom. And when they raised Simba, everybody went back down. The Bible says that the time will come that every mouth will confess and every knee will drop down at the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Maybe all of the people will just every mouth. No, I'm thinking all creation. All creation will not help to say, this is the Son of God. This is the Messiah. There is no one else. There is no one else. And the angel, I remember the angel, told the disciples when Jesus ascended to heaven. And Jesus ascended and saying, what are you guys still doing here? The same Jesus who was lifted up will be the same Jesus that will come in riding in the clouds with giants of what? Fire! And everybody will see it. You have to understand how magnificent God is. You have to, to understand the marvelous creation of God testifies of His holy name. That's why the scientists and all, all the aliens and the continually questions God. It, or they always say it doesn't match with what science says. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand how marvelous God created the world. Amen. How many of you have been to one of the eight wonders of the world? Grand Canyon, for example. Why does everybody, when they go to Grand Canyon, they cannot help but to take pictures? Do you know anybody that went to Grand Canyon and said, oh, that's nothing, I've seen that every day in my backyard. <laughs> like, it doesn't surprise me. Oh, it's just Grand Canyon. No, everybody, when, we, when they see it, what's the first thing they do? They know. How could such a thing ever existed here on earth? Why? Because we are wired to see the marvelous creation of God. We are wired that even though a sunset can make us cry, that when you take selfish, you don't just take selfish, you find a spot that's like, man, look at God's creation. We went hiking about a couple weeks ago. Mount Iron Mountain. <laughs> what is Iron Mountain? It's just a bunch of dirt and rocks, and you try to climb it. And you get, you get really, you're really tired when you get down, that you want to eat a lot after. <laughs> that's what it is. That's what it is. What is there in Iron Mountain? Rocks, <laughs> dirt, plants. I see that every day in our backyard. I don't know, my father in law even have chicken one time in our backyard. <laughs> I see that every day, nothing new. But when you go up there and you see the view, Amen. is that just that your DNA is wired to you that clicks and say, wow. And you take pictures and you share it on Facebook and everybody else says, wow. Why? And you will tell me that's all a product of an accident. Of evolution. Of a big bang that just banded together and start creating and making harmony together. It can't be. Why? Because all creation, number one of our notes this morning, you have to understand and look what it says here, number one in our notes. Because all creation worships his holy name. Jesus Christ says, if not you, the stones will. If you don't worship me, if I tell these people not to worship me, you know what? The whole creation will worship me. Why? Because they acknowledge who Jesus Christ is. Amen. 
But many times we try to make it sense in our three pound brain. The majestic attributes of God. We try to put the water in the ocean into our backyard pool. And we try to make sense that no, God does not exist just because of something that is not going right. Where all the evidence around us, all the evidence around, how many of you have been to Hawaii before? They call that place paradise. You know what, well, every time I, I go there and, and, and it still it never wears out on me, you know, where it's just, the plane is just starting to go lower and lower and you can see it from the top and you can see how the water is just blue. It's not actually blue, it's like turquoise blue. How do you spell turquoise? Blue da da, blue da da. Blue. You want turquoise? Spell it. Blue da da. Blue. Blue. When you see it, it's, it never fails to, to, to amaze me. And they call that paradise. And you know what that tells me? What more is heaven like? Oh my gosh, I'll probably be crying my first week in heaven when I get to see just all the magnificent creatures that are mentioned in the Bible that I will see in heaven. Imagine just how beautiful this planet is and still it's falling apart. The word today is saying that our planet is falling apart. It's true. In the book of Romans it says our, our earth is getting older and older and older. It's groaning to be renewed again. What more is the promise of heaven? What more is the promise of our eternal life that we will spend in heaven? That is just a great testimony of how magnificent God is. Look what it says here. The Pharisees and the religious leaders understood the picture. They understood it. They know exactly what it means. And let's, let's turn about it. Let's read a little bit from the book of Luke. Verse 28. Can we put it up here, please? After telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. And then he told his disciples, as they become to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples. How many disciples? <laughs> Go into the village over there. And he told them, as you enter it, you will see a young donkey. donkey. Why is it important it was a donkey? It wasn't a mule. It wasn't a horse. Because the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9, says that the Messiah will ride on a donkey. And I, have you seen a donkey before? You, you go to Del Mar Fair, you'll see a donkey. It's almost half a size of a horse. It's a small horse. You probably look silly riding a donkey. And people are cheering. Because, you know, especially the Roman soldiers, a horse is a symbolism of strength. But Jesus Christ rides on a donkey. And he says that you will find a donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. And, and tie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks, just say, Jesus sent you. If anyone asks, why are you untying that coat? Just say, the Lord needs it. And the Lord said, so they went and found the coat, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying the coat? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. And right there and then, they understood that Jesus was about to be presented as Messiah. Let's fast forward to verse 20, uh, verse 38. Bless of uh, verse uh, 37, I'm sorry. When they reached the place where the road started down the mountain of olives, all of his followers, say followers, followers. say mathetes. You know, the Greek word that used for disciple is mathete, meaning a student. And Matthias is the same word that is used to the 12 disciples or followers of Christ. So they're not just saying these are just the crowd. Many times you have to understand that Jesus was drawing a crowd. When he fed 4,000 people, most of them are just crowd. They're not Matthias. 
They're not his disciples. But here the Bible says that all his followers or disciples began to shout and sing as they walk along, praising God, God for all the Wonder. wonderful miracles they had seen. Verse 38. Blessings on the King. King. They understood it. This is not the Messiah that will free us from the Roman government. Blessings on the King who comes in. The name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest in heaven. And the following verse of what it says, But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, you have to understand how politically correct they have to address Jesus. They did not call him king, just like everybody else. They call him teacher, rabbi. Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. There are people that's going to feel jelly. There are people that's not going to like how you worship God. There are people that are going to understand why you raise your hand. There are people that are going to understand why you cry when you worship God. There are people that actually probably will mock you the way you worship God. There are people that's going to question you why you worship God. It doesn't matter. You can just tell them, I'm just worshiping my King. The Pharisees are telling Jesus Christ, rebuke your followers, you're creating a commotion. What is this going on? And Jesus Christ said, look what it said, verse 40. He replied, if they kept quiet, the stones, say the stones, the stones. along the road will burst out into what? Tears. Into cheers. Does that mean that the stones themselves will speak and say, nobody can stop Nobody when you are praising Amen. God. Amen. And so we shouldn't let anyone also stop us from worshiping our God. Amen. We're not saying we're going to push this to you. We're not going to say we're going to offend you. We're not going to say we're going to deliberately be loud so we can offend you. No, we're just saying if it's coming true to my heart, I will worship my God wherever I am. Because if I don't, the creation itself will. If we don't worship God, if we don't have a Sunday service today, guess what? The creation is worshiping Jesus still. If you go to Yosemite, the trees, you just didn't hear them. They're testifying of how marvelous God is. All over the world, the creation are singing His wonderful name. Amen. Can you hear the amen? amen? Look what it says here. Jesus was not out of context in his response. He's not, he's not, he's not carrying his own chair. He's not being conceited. He's not saying that, oh, I'm the man. He's just telling the truth. He's just telling them that if I rebuke them, the stones will worship me no matter what anyway. And so what it says here, all creation recognized him and bowed down to him. They respond to his voice because he was there. Creator, look at what it says here. Put this down in your notes. Colossians 1. Just write something down. Make me feel good. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1. Verse 15 to 17. Make me feel like you're listening. Look what it says here. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17. It says here, Christ. Let's read it together. One, two, three. Christ is the peace of the peace of He is the peace Let's start from there. Let's go back. Christ is the one is the visible image of the invisible God. This is what Jesus kept telling the Pharisees that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And they, is he talking about the actual features? No, he's talking about the personality of God. If you have seen me, you have seen God because He is God. He is loving. He is forgiving. He is merciful. He is healing. He is preaching. He is touching people's lives. And so when people say, oh, we have the covenant of Abraham, Jesus Christ says, before Abraham, I was. 
We don't, we don't, we don't get what he said. But here's what he says. I am. The great I am. And so when the Pharisees heard it, what did they do? They start picking up stones. Why? Because to say that you are God is blasphemy. And according to the law of Moses, you are punishable by death. Many people still argue with you. Well, the, the Bible, Jesus never claimed to be God. It never said in the Bible that Jesus is God. How many more do you need to hear? He is the one, the visible image of the invisible God. And here's one thing that's going to blow your mind. You're saying that Jesus existed when it was Christmas. When he was born. No. Jesus existed before what? Everything else. He was God. When God says, Genesis chapter 1, let us make man in our own image. Who is God talking to? Not talking to the angels. It's the plurality of God. Who is he talking to? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The teaching and theology calls this the preeminence. Of Christ. Christ did not exist when he was born of a virgin. Christ existed even before what? The creation of the world. And not only that, this will blow your mind. Verse 16. For through him, who's him? Say Jesus. Jesus. For through him, God what? Created what? Everything. Let's do this together with two hands. The students of God, for God through him, God created everything. Make that wider. For God through him created everything. Not everything. There's a proper pronunciation. Everything. The students of God, for God through him created everything. <laughs> Why are you here today? Because God created you. Amen. Through Jesus. For the purpose of Him. Mm -hmm. That's why everything is into existence. But man and human being has become so proud that we claim that we conquer this planet. That we claim that it is us that makes this planet run. We're getting it wrong. Because the Bible is very clear. God created everything. For what? Through Christ. Through Him, God created everything in heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we cannot see. Such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities, which is the spiritual beings. In the unseen world. Everything was created through Him and for Him. For him. You have to understand those conjunctions are very important. Through Him and for Him. When you decorated a house and when you, when you created a room and you said this is for us, what you're saying is this is for our use. God says I created everything. Through who? The agent was who? Christ. And the purpose is for Him. Christ. So literally, who owns everything? Christ. Christ. Mm -hmm. Who owns what's in your wallet? See, nobody says it. That makes me. Let's go back to it again. <laughs> it's been, yes, Pastor. Hallelujah. We understand that everything belongs to Christ except this. Everything belongs to Him. Everything belongs to Him. That's why our worship to Him is something that we just give back. It's not something that we create. Imagine if God will tell you, okay, if you do not believe that I created everything, why don't you create something out of nothing? Can you really create something out of nothing? 
Can you create a house having your own materials? You're not gonna get from the trees because God created that. You're not gonna create it from a cement because God created that. You're not gonna create it from steel because God created that. So if you create something out of nothing, then you can prove that God did not create this world and did not create the universe. It's simple because the creation testifies who he is. Can you hear that, amen? He existed before anything else. And he what? And he holds all creation together. You know what they say? That humankind will probably die by a big meteor coming or global warming and all this. Those are just the effects of what we're doing in the environment. But ultimately, God is still in control of this planet, whether we believe it or not. Can I hear an amen? amen? Let's give a mighty clap of praise for us. <laughs> if creation testifies of him, his Father in heaven testifies of him, which is our number two point. When Jesus Christ was baptized, came to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist says, no, you should be baptizing me because I'm preparing the way for you. And Jesus Christ says, no, it has to be done so that it will be the fulfillment of what is written in the scriptures. And when Jesus Christ was baptized, the Bible says that the heaven, what? Opened up. And there it goes, descending like a dove. And then a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I am well pleased. The Father testifies of the Son. And look what it says here. Let's turn your Bibles in John chapter 5, verse 36 to 38. This is the greatest testimony of who Jesus is. Peter said, oh actually Jesus said to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, for what you said did not come from you, but it was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. We have to be very careful to say that we know Jesus not because of our own works. Not because I decided to come to church. No, it was revealed to you by our Father in heaven through the Holy Spirit that lives in us and touches now and convicts us of our sin. And look what it says here, John 5, 36 to 38. But I have a greater witness. But I have a greater witness than John, my teachings and my miracles. The Father, what? Gave me these works to accomplish, and they proved that. Sometimes we want to ask Jesus to just do miracles for us without even realizing that Jesus did miracles because it was given to him by the Father to do to verify that he is the Son of God. Jesus was not a circus act during his time. He's not just going out into town and saying, okay, I'm going to perform a trick, so I will entertain you. Okay, I'm just going to turn water into wine, so you will be amazed. No, Jesus himself it says, the Father gave me all this work of miracles so that you will believe. I cannot tell you how many people have asked me to pray for them and pray for a miracle. And the only thing I always respond by telling them is this, you have to Believe. Because God is more than capable of creating that miracle. But after the miracle, if you're just going to say, Oh, thank you God, you healed me. So long. See you later. Then you miss the point. Why God, why God allow you to experience that miracle. And many today still question the miracle of God. And many will ask, how oh, come he doesn't do the splitting of the sea now and this and this? Maybe he has his own plan, he has his own reason, but there's one thing I know. And this is just my, my own, my own uh, opinion, which means nothing. Because we don't believe. We still lack faith. But then we still dare ask God to perform miracles. Jesus Christ says that this witness that I have, the miracles was given to me by my father, this works to accomplish what? And they proved that they, that he sent me. 
If you experience a miracle in your life and you still fail to believe in Jesus Christ as the only Son of God, then what's the purpose of the miracle? That's why I, I see all these faith healer things and going around and telling people they can heal. If it's not pointing you to Jesus Christ, then for me it's nothing but a circus act. Mm -hmm. It's there to entertain you. It's there to make you wonder, oh, how did they do that? How, how did that happen? You know, you can see that. Just go to Vegas. They have a lot of those. But if you want transformation, if you want a real miracle, just look at what God has done in your life. I've heard testimonies of addictions. I've heard testimonies of brokenness. I heard testimonies of actual people who were healed from their sickness. And that turned their life around. Because they see and they not focus only on the miracle, but they focus on who? On Jesus who did that miracle. It's very important for us to understand that Jesus has done all these miracles because it was a testimony that He was the Son of the living God. Can I hear an amen? But I have greater witness. Let's turn to the next um, verse, verse 37. Look what it says here. And the Father who sent me has testified what? About me. How many of you applied for a job before you need a referral? Right? And guess where you get your referral? You don't get it from that guy across the street. You don't get it from that just ordinary person. No, most of the time when you ask for a referral, you want to get it from who? From people who have position. You want to ask a referral from your supervisor. You want to ask a referral if you have, you know, if you work for someone who owns a company. You want to ask for that referral because their testimony has a greater weight. People keep questioning Christ, but Jesus Christ says, I don't need your referral because the only thing referral that I need and what I got is the referral of my Father in Him. Jesus Christ says, and the Father who sent me has testified about me Himself. You have never heard His voice or seen Him face to face because what? And you do not have His message in your heart because you do not Was that a journey song that says belief? You know, this could be a sickness for us Christians because we, we are people of faith. But many times we still fail to believe. Can I hear anyone? Like God will tell you something. God will tell you, this is what I'm going to do to your life. It sounds impossible. It sounds crazy. And you'll be like, mm, okay, God, you said so. Sometimes we underestimate the power to believe. I like when Pastor Jason spoke here in one of our prayer rallies and he says, most of the time the things that you confess is what you believe in. And that is very true. If you confess that you're tired all the time, guess what happens? You feel tired. If you confess that it's not going to work, guess what happens? It doesn't work. If you confess that you're not going to make it, guess what? You're not going to make it. Why? Because you're declaring already what God has said no. I've given you the authority. I've given you the power. I've given you the, the victory. And I'm not saying that you can just say things and it will happen. But it, there's an impact in the things that we say. Because the things that we say is normally what we believe. Oh, it's too early. Oh, it's too late. Oh, I'm too old. Oh, I'm too young. The moment you declare that in your mouth, you're saying to God, God, you have no power. And God is saying, no, I do have the power. Amen. And the power that I have is the power that's been given to me. You know, the problem with the religious leaders was they constantly asked Jesus by whom and what authority he comes in the name of. They always ask him, in what authority are you doing that? In what authority are you forgiving sins? In what authority are you casting out demons? In what authority are you healing? And every time Jesus answered the question, it is from my Father. Guess what they do? They will either pick up stones and try to stone him or what? They don't believe. 
The saddest part that we can ever happen to us is we leave this place and still we fail to believe. We fail to believe that God can work in miracles. We fail to believe that God is still the God that says who He is. Are you with me, River Faith Church? Because God, the Bible says that God, Jesus, is the same today, tomorrow, and forevermore. He doesn't change. There is a theology, there's a part of theology that's called dispensationalism. And in that, in that theology, it says that there's different dispensation. There's a dispensation of innocence during Adam and Eve. There's a dispensation of, of grace that we believe in now. There's a dispensation of law. And there's like different dispensation or time that God deals with His people. But one thing I understand with that is, you know what it is? But God is still the same. That Jesus is still the same. The Jesus that I, that I came to know when I first got born again is still the same now. And that the Jesus that we worship today is still the Jesus that also in other countries that maybe don't have the same liberty that we have. But guess what? He's touching lives. How many of you have seen that video when they open the book, open the boxes with a bunch of Bibles? People just start fucking kissing the Bibles like they've never seen one before. How is that possible? And that is all the way I have Half of the world. What is the point, people? Jesus is still Jesus. <laughs> He's still who He is. And the problem and, and the challenge for us this morning is do we believe in the Holy One of God? Can I hear that? Amen. And let's give that to our God. Let's put those in there. <laughs> Creation testifies His name, the Father testifies who is, and now as believers, last point, the Spirit will guide us into all the truth about Him. John chapter 15, verse 26. But I will send you the Advocate, the Spirit of Truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. The Bible says, do not quench the Spirit. Say quench. Every time I hear the word quench, I think of Gatorade. You quench the thirst. You know, quench... It's, it's also the same word as you, you extinguish a fire. You know, when there's a fire, you have a fire extinguisher to quench the fire. The Bible says that we have to be very careful not to quench the what? The Spirit of God. Because the Spirit of God is what convicts us. There's a big difference with our conscience and with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The whole conviction of the Holy Spirit is God working in us. It's a conviction that's telling us you should not do that. That's not good for you. You know that is a sin. And all that relates to our relationship with God. Our conscience naturally tells us that that is bad. That is, it smells bad. It's, it's not good. And all these things. That's why we can never always trust our conscience. The Bible says that, that the men sometimes have conscience that has been seared like iron. It doesn't work anymore. But what we need is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because if you fail to see that the creation testifies about Jesus, you fail to see that the Father testifies about Jesus, it is the Holy Spirit now that will convict us of our sin. Why is it so important to be born again? And why do we always talk about being born again as not as a religion, but an experience? Because a person who has not been born again has a dead spirit. Dead in sin. I can't tell you how many testimonies I heard from you that says, you know what, Pastor? Now I feel convicted just the little things that I know that I, I'm not doing according to the will of God. Can I hear an amen? Amen. I like how, uh, how uh, Charles Stanley put it. He says, a Christian before they sin, they hear a loud siren. And telling them and warning them that it's not the way that you should go. Amen. That's why when we fall into sin, we can never justify and say, I didn't know. No, you did know, but you choose to quench. You choose to quench the spirit. How many of you feel so much conviction ever before that it just bothers you to the heart? Amen. That you know exactly that, man, that was God talking to me. Exactly that was God talking to me. That was God telling me. 
not to go. That was God telling me to say no. That was God telling me that I should go this way. And you could see the consequences when you say, I should have listened. I knew it was God. There are times that you listen to a radio, even if it's not a Christian radio, and there are words in the song that all of a sudden you're like, God, it's you. I can't tell you how many times I just watch a movie, or I just watch a TV, or I just listen to a song that one of our series came to me. Why? Because that's how God speaks. He speaks to the power of the what? The Holy Spirit. And so if the Holy Spirit is dying in our life, if the Holy Spirit is dead, then there is no power. I just changed my phone. I'm blessed. I like my phone now. That's a big screen. But I change it not just because I'm like you. who just change it for the sake of changing it. <laughs> I feel like I should have asked the congregation, but everybody has an extra phone. I bet probably 50 phones, but that's right, you can use mine. You got so much phone, don't get your offering. <laughs> just kidding. Here's the point, we close with this. I changed my phone, why? Because it turned off. By itself. <laughs> no, no, seriously, seriously. It turned off by itself. It shut off. By itself. And I'm trying rebooting it, I'm trying charging it, and every time I charge it, it will just turn off again. And I brought it to the to Apple store and tell me, it's not sure, but you can change the battery. Maybe the battery is bad. But, but the way it looks, it looks like there is no more power in your phone. <laughs> Without the Spirit, where's the power in our Christian life? Without the Spirit, where's the victory over the struggle? And there's one thing I realize. All the men of God, they never ask God to take away their struggle. Let me put it this way. Paul went through so much struggles in his life, but he never asked God to say, God, take it away. You know what he says? Give me strength so I can be victorious in it. Without power, without the power of the Holy Spirit, how can we ever be victorious in our walk with God? If the Holy Spirit will guide us into all the truth about Jesus, we need to be filled by the Holy Spirit of God. Not just this Sunday, but every day, especially the times that we are in battle and war with spiritual amen. warfare. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Let's give a mighty clap of praise for us. Let's all stand up as we pray together, Heavenly Father. Where is the power now? Why is it sometimes, Lord, we feel like like we are still defeated, God? That the struggle, Lord God, is real. But Lord, you said in your word that you will send us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will give us power. The Holy Spirit will remind us of all the things that you have said. And the Spirit will guide us into all the truth. All, not just some, all. All the truth about you. Holy Spirit, we know that you are a person. You are the third person 
of the Holy Trinity. You are, you are, you are God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we know that you live in us for you said in your word that we are all baptized by one spirit into one body. That the temple of the Holy Spirit is now our body. That this body is now the temple of the Spirit. But you also warn us not to quench the Spirit of God. Lord, our prayer, Lord, may we walk with power, may we walk with victory over struggle, over sin, over temptation, over worrying, over fears, over loneliness, over brokenness. All the things that the enemy may throw at us, God, may we have the victory over them. Lord, we don't want to ask you to take them away because you have given us the power we simply ask God that we may have the power to be victorious, Lord, in our struggles, God. And Lord, we can never be victorious if we're, in, if we're not in the fight. And maybe, Lord God, there are some of us here today, Lord God, that has given up in the fight. Maybe some of us here today has has thrown in the white towel. Lord, may you encourage us once again. Pick us up once again, Lord, and remind us the fight still goes on. And we have won the victory 2,000 years ago by the blood of your Son, Jesus. And all we have to do now is to get the receipt because it's already been paid for. Lord, may we know you, Lord God, this way. May you not just be a name that we heard. May you just not be a story that we, we know and we, we come to understand. At the end of this series, God, may you be Jesus, our Lord, our Savior. Our God. We want to know you more. Jesus, we want to know you more. Let's say it together, Jesus, Jesus, we want to know you more. Holy Spirit, fill us this morning. Fill us the Holy Spirit. Freely move in this place. This morning. May you touch our hearts, may you touch our minds, may you touch our very soul. Oh, Spirit of God, be with us. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this series. We thank you for your words. We thank you for encouragement. We thank you for the power that is available to us as we live here today. Lord, may we redeem that power. May we get that power back because probably the enemy has taken it away from us. May we take it back, Lord. May we never quench your spirit that we may live a victorious life. Father God, we thank you for this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Let's give a right up and pray for God.